Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Everybody say very rich. Very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but was too short, shout too short, to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation, shout salvation, salvation, has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. There ends the reading. Everybody say amen. amen. Please be seated. Repeat this subject with me. I need you to shout it the first week of this series greater. Am I meant for more? Shout it. Am I meant for more? <clears throat> Uh, this passage is a fairly unusual and I would suggest even odd passage in the genre of New Testament scripture. Uh, here's the story. There is a wealthy man by the name of Zacchaeus who lives in a town called Jericho. He is a tax collector, but he's not just a tax collector. He is the chief tax collector of the region. Now, those of you who know anything about New Testament, uh, the world of the New Testament, you know that Jewish tax collectors were among the most despised in their communities because uh, they had the authority to collect on behalf of the Roman Empire the taxes from the Jewish people. But the authority was this. They could collect what's due the Roman Empire, but they could collect it two to three times more. And they could pay the Roman Empire what's due and keep the rest. So they were a part of an extremely oppressive system, if you will, uh, with the Jewish community. Zacchaeus was a man who was a tax collector, but not only that, he was the chief. He was in charge. He had made it to the top, if you will. And he had become very rich. Well, that's not unusual about the context. What's unusual about this story is that a man of Zacchaeus' power and prestige and influence, a man of his level of wealth, he wasn't just rich, he was very rich. Everybody say very rich. rich. Probably meant he had multiple homes and and, and he probably had a Lexus chariot, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, the best of clothes and the jewelry and his kids went to the best education facilities that was in the town. I mean, he was very rich. Now, now what's strange, what's odd, if you will, is, is if you would picture this very rich man so desperate to see Jesus that he actually runs down the road and climbs up in a sycamore fig tree. Now that's odd. <laughs> to give you a contemporary picture of it, just think of Bill Gates, one of the most uh, wealthy men on the planet. Just think if suddenly you saw on CNN news that Bill Gates had run down the street and literally climbed up in a tree. Because he desperately wanted to see something. I mean, wouldn't that be odd? This is odd. I, I, I was wondering, what is it about Jesus that would be so fascinating to this influential, prestigious man, so wealthy that he would throw all reputation to the air, if you will, and, and climb up a tree and not worry about who would see him and what they would say? Well, what, what is it that was fascinating about Jesus? I, I, I thought, well... 
You know, when Jesus was coming into the city, if you read the previous chapter, he healed a blind man who had been, he- been blind for a long time. And so the crowds were around him. But Zacchaeus wasn't blind. He wasn't lame. He wasn't sick. His kids were not sick. It would appear that there was nothing that Jesus could do for him. I mean, after all, Jesus is, he only has one coat and, uh, uh, you know, he's born in a manger. And Zacchaeus is very rich. What's going on here? As I thought about this and prayed this through, it, 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 it seems to me that Zacchaeus must have awakened one morning amidst all of his wealth and all of his possessions and all of his power and privilege and everything was centered around him and and, and I think he must have started to ask the question is this it? Is this the best I can do with my life or am I meant for more? I think that's, that's what was driving him. I think that's the agitating question that was in his life. Am I meant for more than simply this? And I, you know, the question all by itself is an interesting question. Am I meant for more? Uh, you know, birds don't ask that question. The bees that buzz don't ask that question. The fish that swim in the ocean, they don't ask that question. This is a question that is unique to the human population. This, this is a question that reminds us that we are made in the image of God. And no matter how high we climb and how successful we become, that there is always something and someone that is greater than us. And that something and someone that is greater keeps inviting us to not just settle where we are, but to hear him call us into greater. I think that's what was going on. And and I think Jesus coming into town, I mean, I think perhaps Zacchaeus may have heard what John wrote about Jesus, that in the beginning was the word, the word was God. Oh, the word was God. The word was with God. All things were made by him. In him was life. And the life was a light of people. That, that, that Jesus was, in fact, the source of all life. And that Jesus perhaps offered something to Zacchaeus that he couldn't find anywhere else in the world. And he couldn't buy it with all of his money. It was an agitating question. And so that's my first point. I want to suggest to you that if you're here today, it's probably somewhere in your bosom is the same agitating question. Uh, Essentially, that's one of the things that drives us into a facility like this that we call a house of the church is because we come here sometimes invited by friends and invited by family. And the reason why we kind of say, okay, let's go is, is, you know, we tell ourselves we just want to kind of get them off our backs and then we just want to leave, leave. If I go, they won't ask me anymore. But, but, but deep, deep down inside, you know why you're here is because there's a question that says, Is this all there is? Or is it possible that I'm meant for more? And you're hoping, you're hoping that just maybe there's something to this God thing. And maybe he knows your name. I have good news to you, for you. There is something to this God thing, and he does know your name. And so the first challenge I present to you out of this text is let's just be honest and acknowledge the hidden question. Let's say it all together out loud. Uh, Am I meant for more? Shout it. I want you to go home and say, I can ask this question now. 
Regardless of your age, whether you're 20 or 80, regardless of the stage that you're in in life, whether you're married or single, regardless of the context of your situation, whether you just got out of jail or you've been told you're on your way to jail, whether you're educated or non-educated, I want you leaving here asking the question, I'm, I'm, uh, given my age and given my experience, given who I am in the world, am I meant for more? Am I? Or is God finished with me? First question. The second thing that comes to mind that I think is helpful as we think about the next six weeks of this series of greater is the text suggests that we need to be able to acknowledge what I want to call our hidden barriers. The barriers that stand between us and our ability to access to access the greater that God has for us, to, to hear God call us into the more. You know, uh, there's a wonderful passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Get a chance to read it. Go ahead and read the new, the new uh, King James Version. I particularly like that translation of it. Essentially what's happened is that the king of Judah, his name is Asa, found himself in a difficult situation, reached out to the king of Syria and asked him to help. God sent a prophet to the king of Judah and said to him, you were in a difficult situation and you forgot that the last time you were in a difficult situation, you called on me, God, and I showed up. This time you turned to your own. He says, here's the problem. He says, don't you know that the eyes of the Lord goes to and fro throughout the whole planet looking for people whose hearts are loyal towards him so that he can show himself strong in their lives. Everybody say strong. The the better word is powerful. And what he was saying to to Esau is that you were in a kind of weak situation and had you turned to God and said, God, I need your help. God would have shown up and he would have shown himself powerful in your weak situation and you would have moved to greater. Does it make sense? Uh, here's the point. I say that because I think that we read about Zacchaeus looking for Jesus so much that he was going to run and climb. But I want to suggest to you that Jesus came to Jericho actually looking for Zacchaeus. That's why verse 10 says the son of man comes to seek and save that is lost. That is why when he finds that chaos in the tree, he says, I must come stay at your house. Jesus came looking for Zacchaeus. And I want to suggest to you today that your being here is not an accident. God has drawn you here because he who is called Jesus the Christ is looking for you. I get fascinated at how many people say, you know, let me tell you about the time that I found God or I found the Lord or I found Jesus. Well, the fact of the matter is, let me just tell you, God found you. He certainly found me. There are barriers. Everybody say barriers. Barriers, 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 barriers. Here's what I discern from the text. Verse 3 says that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he can't because he's too, what? Short. His height was the barrier that stood between him and his ability to get a glimpse at a call into something greater. And so his running to climb the tree, the sycamore fig tree was really Zacchaeus' attempts to somehow overcome the barrier. Everybody say barrier. The barrier that stood between him and the call to something greater. What's your barrier? What's the barrier that's standing between you and God's calling you into something greater, regardless of your age, regardless of the stage, regardless of the circumstances or ethnicity or community or neighborhood? What's the barrier that's standing in a way that that you've got to find a way over? What's the barrier? 
Could it be the cycle of violence or drugs or alcohol that has gone from generation to generation to generation and you are now caught in that same cycle and you've been seduced by that cycle to believe that there's nothing better for me? Ah! Could it be a past trauma, a a woundedness that took place in your childhood that has so shattered your sense of self-esteem that God is saying, I'm calling you for greater. I've got a greater promotion. I've got a greater dream for you. I've got a greater hope for you. But you shrink back down because you just, he can't be talking to me. What's your barrier? Could it be fear? You know, the fear that comes because you had some major failure in the past or maybe a series of major failures in the past or maybe a huge divorce in the past or maybe your parents divorced and, 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 and now there is a relationship, there is an opportunity and God is standing behind that opportunity. He's standing behind that relationship and he's saying, come into something great. I'm calling you. But because of your fear, you shrink. You stay where you are. What's your barrier? Well, Zacchaeus's barrier was he was short. Now, if you read this in the New Revised Standard Version or the King James Version, they actually translated, they, they amplified the translation. They said he was short in statue. Everybody say statue. S-T-A-T-U-R-E, statue. Statue means height, but it also means reputation. It also means uh, uh, public respect. It means competency, all of that. So here's what one scholar says about Zacchaeus. Watch it. If he was short as a man, you know that he was probably exceptionally short as a kid. That means, if we just postulate, that probably kids picked on him and made fun of him and talked about how short he was. And and perhaps he developed uh, a a, a kind of mentality that says, you know, I I don't measure up. I'm not tall enough. I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. I I don't measure up. And some people think that that's the reason why he became a tax collector and worked his way up to the top because he was doing whatever was necessary for him to try to measure up. You know, trying to measure up can make us do some crazy things. Everybody say good enough. Uh, This highlights for me what I want to call the tyranny of good enough. And I think I'm talking about this notion of good enough that oppresses us, the tyranny. That's what I mean by that. And I think it expresses itself in our lives in at least two different ways. Listen, I'm talking about barriers that's keeping us from hearing God's call into something greater. Ah, Here's one way that I think the tyranny of good enough expresses itself, kind of as a minimal standard. Here, listen, my uh, nephew, uh, I came home Friday. We, We have our nephews, three nephews, we call them the prophets, uh, on on. On weekends, and so they were there. I walked in the house. They were playing, and I said, "Hup, homework. Show me your homework." I said, "What kind of homework? Before you play, let's hear your homework." So they go and they scatter and and uh, they go gather their homework. Well, Zach, uh, Zach arrives at first. He comes. This is a fascinating story. He, he comes in, he tells me his homework. I checked the first. It's okay. You forgot to do the things on the back. So, okay. Then he shows me the second. The second is interesting. He explains it to me. So I don't see any structure. He just explains it to me. He's a 10-year-old. He's a 10-year-old. So he says to me, the teacher asked me to write the first paragraph about me and the second paragraph about Christopher Columbus. And then I'm supposed to connect them. I said, oh, okay, so let me read it. So I read the first. I read the second. He did, wrote the first about himself, second about Christopher Columbus, but he didn't connect them. So I said, Zach, uh, Zachariah, you, you didn't connect them. So you got to rewrite this and go, oh, no. He said, oh. I started to cry. I don't want to do it. I want to go play. I want to get through with this. I said, but son, I said, didn't you tell me that the teacher said, I know, I know, he's a but, but he didn't mean it. <laughs> I, 
I said, what do you mean? He didn't mean it. Are you kidding? I mean, he, he, said, he, he, he said, no, no, he always gives us this. And look, I always do my writing. And he always gives me a check. And he always says, it's good enough. It's good enough. It's, Uncle, it's good enough. I said, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I said, boy, you're too brilliant to settle for good enough as a minimal standard. You're, you're too smart to settle for good enough, just getting by, just sliding by. No, 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 no. God is calling you to something greater. And in a sense, you see, uh, I think Zacchaeus potentially could have, you know, he got used to the routine of just making money and just doing his thing. And, you know, he's just figured, you know, until he reached a point, he said, I don't want to just be good enough. See, some of you, there's a promotion waiting for you, but you, 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 you're just comfortable with good enough. I just show up at nine and I leave at five, no drama. Some of you, there's a depth of love waiting if you would step across the threshold and say, I do the marriage. But you said, no, 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 no. I've got a divorce in my history or my parents divorced and I love her. I love him and all that. It's good enough. Some of you, God wants to bless you in your finances, and you know you've got a pretty good job. You're making pretty good money, and you know you sp you make it yesterday and you spend it today, and you're not saving any, you're not investing any. And if I talk to your body, you say, "Well, you know, I'm paying my bills. It's good enough." But God is calling you into something greater, and He's saying, "You know what? You've got to shake off this mentality of just trying to be good enough." Well, the other extreme is equally challenging, isn't it? It is the extreme of unreachable expectations. It's knowing that your father has an expectation of you and you can never be good enough. Or your colleagues that you compare yourself to and you look at how where they're doing it and, and, and you say, you know what, I'll never be good enough. I, I went back to Cushada and uh, uh, it was a, a, a season of mixed emotions for me. My, my friend who was like a sister to me for 37 years had died at the age of 50 of cancer. I had to do the eulogy. It was a beautiful homegoing ceremony because she lived a beautiful life. She loved Jesus and uh, loved people. And then, because she was a center of our class of 1982, that's my class, uh, about 40% of the class showed up. It's the first time all of us showed up at anything like that. Then afterwards, we were hanging out together, fellowshipping. And I found myself surrounded by a group of guys. The guys that surrounded me uh, when I was about 14, 15 years old, these were the guys that I used to compare myself to. And I was never good enough. I mean, I, I, they, they were exceptional basketball players. I loved to play basketball, but I wasn't that good at it. Uh, they were great at football, and I loved football, but I, I wasn't that good at it. I, they, they were excellent at baseball, and, 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 and I loved baseball, but I couldn't hit, couldn't catch. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, these were the guys, man. They were the fellows on the yard, and the women just flocked to them, but they ran from me. I, I mean, I mean... Uh, <laughs> it was the first half of my high school years, I've been trying to be good enough to get a date good enough to get on the team good enough and then somewhere in there I ran into the same Jesus that Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see really I did and, and, and he, he spun my life around and I don't know when but I forgot about I stopped thinking about them and I started thinking about him and I started thinking about his call on my life. And I stopped trying to be a Kenny Wayne and Jerry Wayne. I stopped trying to be them. I just thought I'd just be me. Come on now. And I just let God handle me. And, 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 and when he got through with me, come on, I showed back up to uh, last week and the same guys that I looked up to now, they're looking up at me. I, I, how did that happen? Come on now. Here's how it happened. I took being good enough, whether as a minimum standard or whether as a comparison, and I threw it away. Said, that's not relevant to my life. 
It's not relevant. Dr. King wrote these words. I love it. Actually, he used to say it in speech. He said, he said, um, if your lot in life is to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well until the host of earth and heaven will have to pause at some point and say, there lived a great street sweeper who swept her his job well. Somebody's called to be a doctor, and somebody's called to be a truck driver, and somebody's called to be an electrician, and somebody's called to be a preacher, and somebody's called to be in the choir. Come on now. Somebody is called to be a teacher, and others are called to be a stay-at-home mom. But, but, but don't compare you to me, and don't compare me to you. Just figure out what God is saying to you, and be the best you that God has called you to be. Don't be mediocre. Don't be just get by. Don't be just, just, the, no. God says, I'm calling you the greater. Unsettle yourself. Get agitated with yourself. The agitation is really God saying, I'm calling you. And so the second thing is I challenge you. To acknowledge your hidden barriers. What is it? Write it out. Because that's what God is going to challenge you to climb the tree over. And here's my last point. First, we have to acknowledge the hidden question. Am I meant for more? We have to acknowledge the hidden barriers. In some cases, it may be more than one. And then we have to position ourselves to accept God's challenge. The chaos is up in the tree. I, I love this. If you read the text, verse 4 says, he runs ahead, climbs up sycamore fig tree on the side of the road because Jesus was going to pass by. In the next verse, verse 5, it says, when Jesus came by, this New Living Translation, but if you read it in the New International Version, or in, in most of the other versions, they translate it this way. They use either one or two words. They say, when Jesus reached the place. Everybody say place. Or they say, when Jesus reached the spot. Everybody say spot. So, the spot, the place where Zacchaeus was. He, 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 I, 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 if you don't get anything else, you got to get this. This is part of why y'all in church today. This is part of why you're hearing this message. Listen, have you ever noticed in Scripture two things? Whenever Jesus shows up, something happens. <laughs> you read in the Gospels, whenever he shows up, something happens. Secondly, he always has <laughs> impeccable timing. He, he shows up always right on time. The disciples were on the boat. It was storming. It was dark. They thought that they were going to die. And then suddenly, right on time, Jesus comes walking on the water. There was a woman with an issue of hemorrhage of blood. She had been bleeding for 12 years, and she had pretty much written her life out. But just before she was to die, right on time, Jesus walks close enough so that she can touch the hem of his garment. Oh, that was a, that was a, come on now, there was a, a woman that had been bent over for 18 years, and, and on this particular day, she decides to go to the synagogue. It happens to be the same day that Jesus shows up and straightens her up. God, I mean, Jesus has impeccable His timing is at work right now. That's why some of you are here. Impeccable timing. And so here's, 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 here's what I think was happening. I told you, Jesus came to Jericho looking for Zacchaeus. His timing was perfect. Because he had let Zacchaeus live long enough to reach a point of kind of frustration with, with where he was. Uh, emptiness with, with all that he had. And, and he reached that place. And, and, and finally, Zacchaeus had come to a place where Zacchaeus was willing to do whatever it took. Everybody say whatever it took. Whatever it took. Say whatever it takes. 
whatever it takes. And, and, and that's where God is for some of you. You know, you've been up and down on your journey. And we like to say, we'll come alongside you wherever you are on the journey. But sometimes God just waits just a little bit. Come on now. Until you come to a place on your journey where you're so agitated, you're so frustrated, you're so just, just, just unfulfilled with all the stuff you have. You got girls, but you're unfulfilled. You got cars, but it's unfulfilling. You got money, but it's unfulfilling. You got population, but it's unfulfilling. And finally, you reach a place where you say, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to find meaning. And that's when Jesus shows up under your tree. He waits till you get to that place. If I say place, will you do whatever it takes? One of my favorite books that I've read in the last two years is a book called The Hole in the Gospel. And uh, it's written by a fellow by the name of Richard Stern. He interweaves his own story into a powerful reminder of what the gospel is really about. It's not just about saving your soul. It is about a revolutionary that should be released in the world. It's changing the world. It includes saving you. And he tells a story about how God called him to something greater. He was a CEO of Linux Company, which was a, a very uh, leading company in what they call uh, 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 dishware. China and silverware and all the finest of that kind of stuff. He was CEO. He lived in the suburbs of Philadelphia. He had a farmhouse that had 10 bedrooms. He drove a uh, Jaguar and he regularly flew to areas like Tokyo and, and Florence and London. And in just a few years, he was making so much money that in just a few years, he would have been set for life. And then he got a phone call. Uh, from his friend who worked for World Vision, this major international organization that tax, tackles poverty all over the world. And the friend said, the friend said, um, uh, Richard, our president is about to step down. So they were talking. And then the friend said, and I was praying, and God says that you are the next president of World Vision. Uh, Richard said he broke out laughing. <laughs> Literally. And then when he got, got himself together, he said, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to question your faith or whatever. You know, I know we've been friends a long time, but you ain't heard God. Because <laughs> there's no way in the world I'm going to leave this plus comfortable job that I'm in. I'm not trained to go do this poverty thing. I, I am a Christian. I pay my tithes. I, I support missions, but, 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 but uh, that's not me. Okay. So the guy said, well, just turn in your ray. He said, oh, no. I'm not turning in my resume. He said, well, how are they going to determine whether or not you're not? He said, that's the point. They will not. <laughs> so he hangs up the phone. Six months later, literally six months later, uh, his senior vice president sends him a little note, says there's an ad in the Wall Street Journal. I, I, I want to suggest you take a look at it. He said, we're not trying to get rid of you. You're phenomenal. He says, but this reminds me that I often thought you'd do something like this. So he opened the Wall Street Journal, and it turns out that World Vision had only advertised this one time. It was that one time, and the advertisement was for CEO of uh, the president of the American branch of World Vision. He, he shook it off. It was a coincidence. Two months later, he gets a call from a recruiter. He gets on the phone with the recruiter. The recruiter says, I'm calling from World Vision. He said, oh, did my best friend put you up to this? He said, no, I don't even know the guy. And then they have a conversation. He explains to World Vision. He knew, already knew all that. And then finally, the recruiter says, do you know anybody who can fill this position? And Richard said, no, I don't know anybody. And then the recruiter said, well, what about you? And Richard said, absolutely not me. <laughs> and, then, and then the recruiter said, you know what? While we've been talking, the Holy Spirit has confirmed in my heart that we should at least have dinner together. And Richard said, look, you're in Indianapolis and I'm in Philly. I don't know how that's going to happen. And the guy said, I'll fly to Philly. And then Richard said, well, don't, nah, don't worry about it. I'm not interested in it. And then the guy said, listen, Richard, are, is your heart open to whatever the will of God is for your life? And 
And it was that question that opened up Richard and he ultimately had to concede. And within a few months, he was the new president of World Vision. And what he thought was moving towards least moved him towards greater. He is so happy. He says he's never been more blessed than in this work that he's doing right now. I don't know whether you were listening to Pastor Tilden. I, I, this jumped out at me. I was listening to his sermon uh, this past week, and this jumped out at me because he gave a little sketch. He, he told y'all. I, he, he was moving kind of quickly, so you might have missed it, but he told you just a little bit of his testimony. Do y'all remember? Let me fill in some pictures, pictures that he didn't tell you. You know, he comes out of a family. His father is a, is, a, is a distinguished engineer who went to Stanford and graduated and worked with the UN and all of that. So our friend, my, my colleague, Pastor Tilden, he's coming through Stanford just like his dad. He's an engineer major, right? He's ready to, 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 to graduate and go make big money, big impact. But what he said to you was that every time he came to a church setting like this, he heard the Lord speak to him through the messages. And the, and the word of the Lord was, I'm actually not calling you there. I'm calling you to vocational ministry. And he was like, I can't be hearing you right, God. This can't be you. I don't want to do that, right? I want to be a good Christian man at, at a big corporation, make lots of money. I can pay good tithes. Come on now. <laughs> I'll be faithful. <laughs> But he kept hearing God. He kept hearing God. And ultimately, he had to concede. Or rather, he chose to concede. You see, whenever God calls you to something greater, you always have to either take something on or you have to let something go. But it's always something he's calling you. So he let go of that dream of a corporate exec with all the skills that he had. And he moved into a small apartment. And his wife, he got his kids. You know, he didn't even pay for cable. And he started working for the church, right? And he couldn't imagine that today he would be on this staff doing this great work for the kingdom of God. <laughs> Shout greater! Shout greater! God is saying to somebody, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to walk away from? What are you willing to leave? Are you willing to quit, uh, 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 cut back some hours so you can go back to school? Uh, when somebody says, I have a passion, and I just, whenever I see the orphans in Africa, I, I'm just moved. Well, maybe God is saying he wants you to change career and join uh, 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 and, and hook up with a, an adoption agency that helps place those orphans in homes, Maybe. Or maybe he's calling you the foster parent. Or maybe the person who walks around and says, I wish I could do something about hungry, homeless people on the street. Well, maybe he's calling you to be a part of a plan to develop a shelter. I don't know. Or maybe he's calling some of you here. You know, you've been coming, you're sitting on the pew. But he's saying, to you, you know what? Uh, whenever the Holy Spirit starts stirring, people have to start moving. And so maybe he's saying, I want you to open up your house and get some other Christians. We call them life groups. Host them, would you? Maybe he's saying, you, you ought to be a host. Maybe he's saying to somebody, you've been in a life group for uh, six months. And even before this started, you were in another group for two years. And not one time have you ever been fully honest with that group. You're being called to something greater. Bless others and be blessed. I, 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 I don't know. But, but here's what I learned from the text. When Jesus came up under the tree and he said, come down quickly because I, I need to be at your house. And the fellow scaled down the tree and, and the text suggests he received Jesus with a welcome hand. And then in verse 8, he stands before Jesus. Here's the transition that I'm trying to get y'all to make. Here's the greater that happens in the text. He stands before Jesus. And the first time in 10 verses, we no longer say Jesus. We say, Lord. Everybody say, Lord. Said he stood in the presence of the Lord and he said, Lord, come on now. If I'm ready to give half of my wealth to the poor. Now, that's, that's transformational right there. How do you move from living to get money to beginning to say, I'm going to give half of it away to the poor. That means I'm going to build homeless shelters and I'm going to clothe people. I'm going to do things to transform the community. Well, what is he doing? He's moving from a me focus to a meaning focus. Come on now. And he's moving into impact in the world. And if I've afforded anybody, I'll give them back four times what I do. The move from me to meaning is the move into something greater. 
to move from how do I get for me to how do I do for others is where you find meaning. And it's not just how do I do for others for me. How do I help you so I feel better? It is when you decide what he decided, Lord, I want to be your instrument in the world because what happens with you lasts for eternity as eternal meaning. So I want to be your instrument in the world. Self meaning. This is meaning for the parent who's so frustrated with their kids and they're saying, the kids is blocking me and stopping me and all of this. Why don't you shift and say, God has called me to be an instrument and he's placed me in the lives of these children and he wants me to raise up strong men and women of God. Suddenly you find meaning. The husband or the wife that is so frustrated with the marriage and it's always me and it's me and it's me and it's me. I'm hurt. It's my feelings. You didn't talk to me. How come you forgot? How come you didn't? But you heard this text and God says, I'll move you from me to meaning. And if you see that, I have put you there as an instrument for my grace and my love. And so why don't you adopt the posture of serving the other? Somebody say greater. So here's the prayer I want you to pray. And if you're going to pray this prayer, all I need you to do is just write it on the card. But here's the prayer. Just say, I'll pray. Here's the prayer I want you to pray. I want you to pray for the next few weeks. In addition to praying for your lost loved ones, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to pray. I I want greater God. So here's the prayer. Give me the confidence to believe that with you, nothing is impossible. Give me the clarity to see what my next step is and then give me the courage to act. And everybody said, greater. Greater. 